Hey there, everybody. This is Dave Holzer again. Nice to welcome you back. Glad you could join us. Uh, I don't know how many of you were at the live stream or at the keynote yesterday. If you were, you know, hello. Good to see you again. I hope the Threat Hunting Summit's going well. If you were there, please, please just put something in the chat there. It's uh, good to see you folks again. Uh, but this week, this week, we're kind of wrapping things up. We've been on this adventure, learning a little bit about TensorFlow and Zeek and getting to talk to each other. And in fact, to that end, I'm going to try to be a little more organized this week because I feel like our last live stream, my goodness, I just went all over the place. So here's where we've been. What we have done so far, we have figured out how to get our Zeek to talk to, uh, to Python externally. And we're using Broker to do that, a built-in library. And while we are accessing that from Python, you can actually access that from other libraries too. Well, we took care of that piece, got Zeek to talk to us. And then in our second live stream, what we did is worked out how to get Zeke to send us the beginning of every stream. Now, you might remember that my, my theory, my hypothesis was maybe we can do some anomaly detection to do protocol identification, in particular, finding protocols I don't expect to see by taking just the beginning of that payload, because that's going to be where the application header is within the stream. So we managed to get that to happen. And then in the Python side, and this is what took us so much time in the last one, we wrote some code that would translate that out into a NumPy array of bits. So we, at this point, are able to get that data, pull it out, turn it into bits, and we are ready to try to build a neural network. So that's what we're going to turn our attention to now. And let me just move over here. I want to just let you know where we are so far, because I've actually done just a little bit of work when you folks weren't around, just because to get started, we need to have some data to work with. So I did a little bit of work on the, uh, uh, what did I call it? I think it might be called Build Data, actually. I, I wrote it like two weeks ago, so I just don't remember. Uh, is this it? Yes, it is. So here's what this code does. In order to train my neural network, we need to have some training data. I mean, without that, there's just no way that we can get it to learn anything. So where are we gonna get the training data from? Well, this isn't training data I can just go off and get from somewhere on the internet. That's actually a question people frequently ask. Hey, where can I get my training data? Well, for the problem we're solving, we need to build our own. And there's nothing wrong with that but I also don't want to just randomly craft connections. That's, that's not gonna be good real world training data. So I wrote this little broker script here, or this little Python script that connects to our broker backend. And if you look at what it does, it just grabs the beginning of every stream that it receives, and it then writes that data into a file. And I'm dropping that into files in this training data folder under whatever port number was in use. And I've actually done just a little bit of post-processing on that. All I did was rename a couple of these files. I renamed the port 80 stuff to HTTP and the TLS stuff but from 443 to TLS. So if we have a look at some of these, like the TLS file, what we have in here on each line, this is the stream data that was sent to us by Zeek. And looking at it, we can see, look at that, there are, there are definitely commonalities happening in the beginning here. But after that, it becomes, you know, more or less random from our point of view. Uh, whether it's still part of the application header or we're now looking at encrypted data, that, that doesn't really matter. But I can see that there's some header here. I don't want to have to learn how to parse that. I don't want to have to go read the RFCs on this. I want to see if I can train a neural network to identify that. And more particularly, to identify whether something is this or isn't this. That's really where we're heading. And if we just compare that to maybe the HTTP file, you can see here again, we've just got data in it and there will be commonalities. For instance, this here, this would be GET. Well, that's not a big surprise because we're going to find that many things are going to begin with GET and then I have a space because that's how most of our queries begin. And I'm sure there's some others in here. I'm sure there's posts floating around. But similar to our, our TLS data, we've got, after that, what we can view as effectively random data. 
though I can see that a different character space is in use. For instance, these are definitely ASCII characters as opposed to the binary characters that we had in our TLS data. And, and I can see that based just on the fact that I'm looking at a, uh, um, the, the values that are in the hex, so the range of this hex. So I see uh, Donatus is asking, can you get this video after now? Yeah, so once we stream these out, these are posted in the Blue Team channel over on YouTube. So feel free to you know go back and point people at these things. And in fact, if you missed out on maybe the first two live streams or, or maybe you tuned out during the second one, which I totally understand. I mean, I feel like I lost my way in the middle of that second one. So if you left, but now you say, oh, you know, maybe I want that, just go back and watch them. In fact, it, if you want, in YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube, go down, right down there and click on that subscribe link. Or if you're watching us through LinkedIn, maybe go in and use that follow link so that you'll get notified whenever we have live streams happening, in particular, this, this regular live stream. Uh, in any event, let me see here. Yeah, so Jared, that, that's exactly what's going to happen. These, do, these are being recorded. So there's been a lot of traffic passing over this network. You can see that there's some SSH data and other kinds of things. Maybe not as much as you might expect. And on the other hand, maybe way more ports than you expect. We're not going to look at all of it for right now. We might look at some more of it. I know I will definitely be looking at the HTTP data. Let's just see how big the 53 data is. Yeah, it's not very large because this is TCP data we're pulling out, but still, that might be some useful data for us to examine as well to see if it can distinguish between the two. The reason there isn't more is because remember, I'm not showing you one of our production sensors. So this sensor is sitting in a lab and it's just able to see whatever passes through on that, uh, on that lab network. Hey there, Stephen, nice to see you there from DC. Now, that's the data we have that we're working with. And let me switch back over here to Jupiter then. And I'll tell you what we need to do. So all I've done while you were gone is build a little bit of training data. But it's now time for us to follow these steps. What I want to do is actually build the autoencoder. Now, to make that happen, it's finally time for us to start working with TensorFlow. I'm going to start by just doing some imports here. So let's import TensorFlow as TF. I don't know if I'll actually ever want to call TensorFlow directly, but if I do, I'm going to have it handy. But in building my model, I know that I'm going to use a couple of things out of TensorFlow. In fact, particularly out of the Keras portion of it. So the Keras library used to be a separate library, but it's been incorporated into TensorFlow for some time now. And what it does is create a really nice, easy set of abstractions that make use of the TensorFlow library for machine learning. So we're going to use that. And from it, I'm going to import both the sequential model, because that's the type of model we're going to use, also called a feed forward model. That's what we're going to build. And I'm going to import the, uh, the layers section, which will include things like dense layers and CNNs and things like that. Of those, we're only going to need the dense layer, but I'm going to import it this way. So just in case maybe later I want to experiment and pull in something else, I don't have to go and re-import anything. Now, with that done, actually, I think that I'll even, just to make my life easier, let me from tensorflow.keras. Uh, that layers, let me import dense because I know I'm going to build some of those. And just to save myself some typing, I think I'm going to import it in that way because now I don't have to do the, you know, layers.dense. I can just type dense. Finally, I know for sure we're going to be manipulating some data. So I'm going to import NumPy and I'll use the standard NP for that. Now, when I load mine up, when I import my TensorFlow, I'm getting this, uh, this warning here. And and it is, well, it's coming up as a DL error, but there's there's really nothing to be concerned about here. So if you're trying to reproduce this yourself and you get this, don't worry about it. Here's what this is about. The dev sensor that I'm doing this work on does not have a GPU. And as a result, the GPU libraries are not installed either. So TensorFlow is checking to see, hey, are, are there any GPUs I can use here, particularly a CUDA GPU from NVIDIA? And the answer is no. So I'm just getting this warning here. And I know it shows as an error, but in this case, it's actually a warning. It's, it's not going to affect us at all. Now, for the training we do, it's going to go pretty fast. 
but it's blazing fast. If we were to do this over on our actual machine learning system, I'm not going to do that there, though, because I want to stay where the data is so I can do this experimentation with the live system. All right. Anyway, so I've, I've got that done. The next thing I need to do is maybe go back to the notebook that we were working with in the last couple of episodes, because one of the last things we did, and you can actually see it right here, is we created this code here in this cell that allows us to pass in the stream data as Zeke presents it, and it returns to us that NumPy array of bits. So I'm not going to go through writing that again. I'm not going to explain the code to you. If you're interested in maybe how that code came about or why it works the way it does, we'll go back and take a look at, I believe it's live stream number two. Let me just load that in. And I'm going to leave it the way we had it to start with, which was using 32 bytes. Now, with that done, it means that the next step would be to load in our training data. So that training data, I know where it is. It's going to be in training data. And I'm going to work with the TLS data. So that's the file I want to load. I'm going to say with open that file as a read as F so that I can now work with that file. And what I'd like to do is I would like to iterate over all of that. So for a line in F.read lines, that's what I'd like to do. And I'm going to write this as a list comprehension. Now, I, I don't know how often you use list comprehensions. I'm actually kind of curious. How many of you folks regularly use list and dictionary comprehensions in Python? Or for some of you, do you find that, oh, they're they're almost impenetrable sometimes? They're, they feel like they're really challenging. I'm kind of curious what your stand is on those. The reason list comprehensions are so great is that they are actually far more performant. Now. In this task here, the performance isn't critical because, I mean, I'm going to read this file in once and never have to do it again. However, if I needed to read data regularly, it would make a lot of sense for me to optimize this in some way. I'm just going to write it as a list comprehension. And the way I go about doing that is by writing this list comprehension backwards. Backwards from the point of view of the list comprehension. Yeah, I hear you, Joe. They give you a headache. I'm going to write it backwards from the point of view of someone writing a list comprehension. But I write them this way because it makes it make it easy for me to write them. So this is what I would write if I were writing a regular for loop, an irregular iterative loop. Well, now I'm going to turn it into a list comprehension. So I'm just going to stick the square brackets around it because I know that's what I'm making. And I've already got the iteration part. Now I just have to say what I want to do with those things. What I'd like to do is run content to features. That's the function from above on each one of those lines. And that's it. We have now made it a list comprehension. What comes out of that? Well, what comes out of that is a list that will contain all of the content to features outputs. So in other words, we are going to call content of features on every line and produce a, a NumPy array of bits. This will be a list of NumPy arrays of bits. That's all this does. I should probably capture that, though, because I do need to do something with that after we're done. So I'm going to call that raw data. All right, let's just run that. And that will probably take it a few seconds to run. While that's running, let me start working with that data. I'm going to take that data, and, and this is a nice thing about Jupyter. I can have that task running, and I can actually go on and continue writing code. It, there's no problem with that. So x data, I'm going to say that's going to be equal to a NumPy array. So I'm going to convert the raw data to be a NumPy array as type np.uint8. And then let's look at x data.shape. And let me explain to you why I'm doing that. The data we have loaded in, we have loaded in these bits. And there's a chance. Now, it really shouldn't happen because of how I've built this here. These are going to be numbers. And you can see that they're NPU and 8. But I've also regularly done this kind of task reading the data out of a file. And in that case, what you'll find is that it gets parsed out as strings. So because I often do that, I'm doing this really unnecessary step 
of converting those to uint8 unsigned 8 bit integers, even though I actually already know they are that. I'm sorry, it's just habit that I'm doing that. What this tells me then, though, is that I have 197,000 plus examples to work with. Each of those rows is made up of 256 bits. In fact, if we were to look at maybe x data sub zero, you can see we have an array of bits. There it is. That represents one of our examples. The next thing I want to do then is get this ready to use as training data. I really could use it as is. This is especially true since what we're building is an autoencoder. Now, I will define an autoencoder for you in a couple of minutes and show you a little animation that kind of tries to make it clear what's the difference between that and a regular neural network. So I'll come back to what that means. But because I'm creating an autoencoder, I really don't need to have a test data set. However, because I want to see how well this performs, comparing it to TLS data and other data, I'm going to set aside a test training set anyway. So to do that, I'm going to call x train. So the data I'll use for do training to do training is going to be x data, x data, and I'll use everything up to one nine zero 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 zero. So I'll take the first 190,000 rows and make that the training data. And I'll make the test data, x data, 190, the end. But that splits these two apart. There we go. Now, if you've done machine learning kinds of things before, but you haven't worked with an autoencoder, you might be looking at that and saying, OK, I kind of follow you, but it feels like there's something missing. So have any of you created a neural network before? Yes or no? Have you ever built a neural network before? Have you used TensorFlow or PyTorch? I know some people were asking about that a few weeks ago. Now, please put something in the chat there. Let me know which of those you have done. You either have or have not used or built a neural network before. Because the thing that it might feel like is missing are the labels. Normally, when you build a neural network and you do a fit, you have to tell it what the training data is, and then you have to tell it what the labels are or what the expected outputs are. So this might be a little bit weird because I actually don't need that separately. Instead, we're really at the point where we're ready to define that network. But to do that, let me just explain to you the difference between a neural network and an autoencoder. So I, I prepared a couple little videos to go with this. Let me show you. Here is sort of a way you could think about a neural network. The neural network is this feed-forward network, which we have shown here, where all of these nodes within that network are connected. This is also called a dense network or a fully connected network. And on the left-hand side, you can see x1, x2, x3. So those are all of the inputs that are coming into the network. Then we have these hidden layers in the middle. That's where all the magic happens. That's where the learning occurs. And on the right-hand side, I have these y hat 1, y hat 2, y hat 3. Those are the outputs or the output layer. And in this case, we're looking at a neural network in a very typical configuration being used to do a classification task, where this network has been trained perhaps to distinguish between cats and dogs and chairs and trees and houses. And when I feed in a chair, what comes out of the other end is the y hat 3, so the chair neuron, has the greatest activation. In other words, I think that's a chair. That's what the network is telling us. So when I train this network, what I'm going to do is pass in x's, inputs, of hundreds of thousands, of millions, of different images, let's say, of these five things along with a label that tells it. And after you process this, you should decide that it's a chair. Now, when the network starts out, it's completely random. It's going to get it totally wrong. So the network for learning now says, how would I have to readjust how those hidden layers work so that I would have called that a chair? That's where the learning occurs. And there's a lot of math involved in that. I'm not going to go through that. If you really want to learn more about that, I mean, you could come talk to me in the SANSEC 595 class. We'll tell you all about how that goes. 
but but for an autoencoder, it's a little different. Here's an example of an autoencoder. And you'll notice we again have that input layer over there, and then we have hidden layers in it. But notice now that in that in that neural network, what we're looking at is is sort of this hourglass shape turned on its side. What's happening is we're asking the network, we're going to give the network a picture. So let's say I give it a picture of a chair and we're going to have it try to reconstruct that chair from the input. Now, since we're starting out with a lot of features and then pushing it down through this bottleneck, and then letting it expand back out. What's really happening is we are ending up with a compressed representation of a chair in that very center layer. That's what's happening. And the other intermediary deep learning networks, the, the other hidden layers, they are learning about features, things that represent chairness. Bites that on the other end, we hopefully get something that looks kind of like a chair. Now, in this case, we put in a chair on the left that is, you know, kind of a wood chair. But what we get out is kind of that, you know, maybe living room chair. Well, if you put a different chair in it, you're going to still get something similar to that living room chair. Because the autoencoder isn't trying to reconstruct the chair you had. It's trying to distill that in that image there is a chair. So I'm going to reconstruct from that, from the compressed representation, something that is chair-like. But what happens with this same network if the thing that I send into the network isn't a chair? Let's say, for instance, we put in an image of the rock. Now, don't take this the wrong way. This, this, I realized that after I created this, there's no sly joke here. I mean, I think the rock is awesome, and he seems like a really nice guy. But you see, if this network knows how to reconstruct chairs, and I put Dwayne into the input layer, there's no way it can produce a chair from that because he's not a chair. So instead we get, let's say, a radish or more likely just random junk. But there's huge value in that because I think that you and I can see that that radish looks nothing like a chair. It is not chair-like in any way. We're doing that visually but it turns out we can do that mathematically as well. And doing that mathematically is, is what we're going to do. We can look at the error. We can look at the loss. We can look at how not chair-like is it, but expressed in terms of a quantity. That's what an autoencoder does for us. And it's going to allow us to begin to stub out this idea of anomaly detection. So let's see what we've got here. Oh, um, LinkedIn user, I don't know who you are, but it's good to see at least one of you has built a neural network before. Um, there's another question. Is the sample training data available for following along? You know, I, I didn't publish it anywhere, but is, is there interest in that? So if how many of you would like to get the training data I'm working with? And, you know, there's nothing secret in it. I'm very happy to publish it. I just didn't bother. And if there's uh, at least a couple of people, I'll set up a GitHub repository and we'll see if we can... Maybe uh, maybe in the next live stream, we'll make sure you get, your, get you a link for that. So if you are interested in that data, please do let me know. Just drop a note there into that chat. Maybe maybe we should just establish a, a GitHub repository for this live stream channel. I mean, is that a good idea? What do you think? Should we have a GitHub just for everything we do in here? Let me know what you think. Anyway, we are now ready to start building this network. So let me get that started. I'm going to begin by saying, I need to know how many dimensions there are in my input. So I'm going to say input dimensions is going to be equal to how many features are there? How many things am I getting? Well, the answer to that is the number of bits that are being produced. Well, that would be, that would be the max length value. Because remember, up here, I defined max length to be 32. Because we're starting out with 32 bytes. Max length. But that's in bytes times eight. That's how many bits there are in each sample. All right, excellent. So what do I do next? Now I define the model. I'm going to say this is a sequential model. So that would be a feed forward model. That is the kind of models that I showed you in those animations. Both of those are feed forward models. 
And let's see what I want to do next. I want to add in a layer. So I'm going to use model.add. And what we're using right now is sort of the, um, the API version of this rather than the functional version. Now, the functional version is even more powerful because I can create models that have multiple inputs, have multiple outputs that bif bifurcate in the middle and then come back together or feed things down later, any kind of structure you want. I'm not going to do that here. There's just no need. Again, if you're super interested in that, I can sure teach you how to do it. That's what's in that applied machine learning for cybersecurity professionals. That's what's in SEC 595. Well, anyway, so I'm going to add in my first layer here. This is going to be a, a, a dense layer. I think I imported that on its own. If I didn't, we'll find out soon. And what I'd like this to have is this many neurons. So I'm going to set this to have the same number of neurons as the input dimensions. Now, the reason I'm doing that, it goes back to how that autoencoder functions. So look at that autoencoder image again. You can't really see it so well in the image I have here, but notice that the number of neurons on the input layer and the number of neurons on the output layer, it's exactly the same number of neurons. So if I'm feeding you 256 bits and I'm asking you to reconstruct those as bits, well then, I had better give you 256 bits on the output. We're making the inputs and the outputs the same because remember, it's trying to reconstruct a chair, or in this case, Dwayne Johnson, or for us, our TLS data. That's what it's trying to do. All right, so the input dimensions, it's gonna be that many. That's how many neurons there will be. And I know this feels like a weird thing to have to do, but one of the things that you have to do within TensorFlow when you're using this, this style of creating a neural network is you need to tell it what the shape of that input is. It feels like it should be able to infer that, but you have to tell. So the shape of this here will be the number of input dimensions. And this is passed as a tuple. Now, right now, that's not a tuple. Right now, that is a, a number sitting in parentheses. So I'm just going to stick this comma at the end. So this is now a tuple. All right, so there we go. So that's how many dimensions there will be or how many how many input dimensions there are. Now, for some of you, you might be you might be thinking, you might know that, uh, well, isn't there an input layer? Couldn't you just add model.add input? Well, you could, but it's not like it's discouraged or anything, but you don't typically do that unless you're using the functional model. We're not doing the functional approach. We're using the API approach. So I'm gonna use the input shape keyword field. So, all right, we have a couple of people who want the GitHub repository. Absolutely, we'll take care of that. Uh, we Tune in then. So if you haven't done it already, click that subscribe link or click on that follow button you've got over in LinkedIn. And in the next live stream, we'll talk about that. And we'll make sure that in all of the future live streams, we include a link to that, maybe in the running, uh, running banner we've got or something. So that you'll be able to find that stuff. You can come and get this data too, if you'd like. All right, phenomenal. So I've, whoop, okay, so when... Jupiter does that. What Jupiter just did is it indented me. What that means is I have got something going on with my parentheses because it thinks that I'm still doing that last thing. So let me just add another parenthesis in there. There we go. Left one off. So that's my first layer. That's my input layer. What I want to do now is build that hourglass shape. So I'm going to kind of go the easy way to do this. Let me do model.add um, a dense layer. And I'm going to say that this will have, let me just, you know, balance my parentheses now so I don't get in trouble later. It's going to have input dimensions divided by two. Now, input dimensions divided by two, but that's not a division symbol. Or is it? Well, it actually is. That is a division symbol, but that tells us to use integer division because I'm here being asked to define an integer value that's going to be used to say how many neurons there are. I can't say that there are 16 and a half neurons. That, that doesn't work. I know we use the expression half a brain. You, you can't do that. So I'm going to use integer division here. And in our case, I think it'll work out because we have 256 features. But even if our input change shape, that's still going to force it to be 
an integer division. It, you might be thinking to yourself, though, well, why don't you just define that manually? Why don't you set it to like 128 then or 64 or something? Well, because I've, had, I've done this before. I don't mean this problem. I mean, I've built networks before. And one of the things about this space is that it's an empirical science. What I mean is, empirical is a fancy word. It means experimental. There's no right way to do this. I mean, an autoencoder should have an hourglass shape. You generally start with a high dimensionality and work down. But how many should be in the middle? Well, I don't know. How many should be in each of the other layers? I don't know. And what you do is you try it, see how well it performs. And if it meets your needs, we're going to call that right. If it doesn't meet your needs, we're going to tinker with it until we now get an adequate level of performance. Well, because of that, one of the things that I could imagine changing would be the number of bytes being sent in the input. Well, because I might change that, it makes a lot of sense for me to think about that up front now, so I don't have to go rewrite the code and change all the numbers. So let me define all of these layers relative to the number of features I have. That just makes sense. So I'll say divided by two, and then I need to define what's called an activation function. Now, the activation function I'm going to use here is ReLU, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit. And, and guess what? I actually have an animation of that as well. So hang on one second here. Let's get the animations up here. So Rectified Linear Unit is a pretty simple thing. The activation functions in general, all they do is make the output of the neuron nonlinear. That's their sole purpose. There's a variety of options of things you can use here. Uh, you can actually use anything you want to here, but common ones that are used are things like the hyperbolic tangent function or maybe the sigmoid function. There's uh, uh, the exponentiation function. There's the swish function. There's a pile of these things. The one I'm using here is the rectified linear unit. What it does is make sure that the output isn't linear, which matters because if it were linear, it effectively means that I could build 20 layers, but if they're all linear layers, well, effectively, that can all get collapsed down to just one layer. It doesn't really matter. There's no added complexity. It looks harder, but it isn't. By adding this nonlinearity, there's no shortcut way to collapse those down. So every layer becomes relevant. And this was actually a very important innovation that allowed deep learning to happen. Without this innovation, without this realization in the late 1990s, it would be impossible to build neural networks the way we do them today. I'm choosing to use rectified linear unit for just one simple reason. The output of this network should be bits. Well, since it's bits, I really should be looking at, out at an output that's either a zero or a one. And because of that, to me, I don't feel like I really need any negative numbers in there. So using rectified linear unit seems like a totally fair thing to do. Is it the best thing to do? I don't know. We could try it with our other activations, but I'm going to try it with this one here, and we're going to see how that goes. So I'm going to define that to be a rectified linear unit, and then I'm simply going to copy this layer, and let me paste in a couple more copies. Let's see how that works out. I'm going to divide by 2, by 4, by 8. So that's going to collapse us down. Is that enough? I don't know. Let's start exploding it back out. So I'm now going to bring this back out. Let's go out to four, to two, and then I'm going to need one more of these. But this one, the output is just going to be input dimensions. And that takes us from this many, this many features coming in and the same number of features coming out. That's it. So that, that's our network being defined. It's as easy as that. The next thing we need to do then is to ask TensorFlow to build that as a model, to compile it. So to compile it as a model, that's pretty easy. We're just going to use model.compile optimizer. So the optimizer is how it goes about doing a thing called backpropagation. How does the learning actually occur? And I'm going to use Atom. Now, I invite you to go ahead and read up on Atom if you'd like to. I'm not going to go through all of that. Again, that's kind of mathy. It's a little beyond what we're going to do in a live stream. I'm just going to use Atom. It tends to work generally for most problems, so we'll use that. 
And I also need to define some kind of a loss function. Now, this, this problem could make use of any loss function you want, but there's only a few that make sense. You might, you might try to use something like the cross entropy loss function which could make sense because you could look at each bit as a different category and it's going to calculate the cross entropy or the log loss with relationship to each bit. So that would work. You could also use the mean squared error function, which works pretty well. One of the reasons I like that function is because at large values, the larger the loss, the bigger the loss will appear. And the smaller the loss is, so it's got this nice slope to it. So you can learn really fast and then slow down as you get to having lower and lower loss. So that's kind of a nice thing. But in this case, I'm not going to use either of those. In this case, I'm going to use the mean absolute error. Now, just a little bit of trivia. Uh, I actually had an opportunity to watch someone on the TensorFlow team do a discussion or, or a presentation about uh, this particular loss function or we're using it. And it was actually kind of funny. I'm, I'm not, you know, giving them a hard time or anything. I know absolutely this guy knows what this is. But every time he said MAE, he said that it was the mean average error. And it's just a, it's just a slip of the tongue, but he's not the only one I hear say that. MAE is not mean absolute error. Mean means mean or average. So it wouldn't make any sense to say the average, average error. That doesn't make sense. This is the mean absolute error. The difference between the mean error and the, or the mean absolute error and the mean squared error is, is just that the reason we square the mean squared error is so we don't have negative numbers. This is that. It's in fact, you could view it as the square root of the mean squared error. That's all it is. Of course, we don't have to calculate the mean square root. The reason I don't use it a lot outside of autoencoders is because its function is just two lines. And they're straight lines. There's nothing happening at zero. I don't prefer that because it doesn't really tell us how wrong we are. And mean squared error is usually good at that or better at that. But for the problem we're working with, this actually works pretty well. So I'm going to use the mean absolute error. And then I'm going to tell it to model.fit using the X train data. So that's the input data. Now we're back to that problem. What are my labels? I need to give it a set of labels. If you go and look at the documentation, it says you have to pass it labels. Well, remember, this is the autoencoder. So if I'm putting a chair in the front end, I want to see how well it can reconstruct the chair coming out of the back end. So what's the output? The output is also X train. In other words, take this input, push it through this network and see if after compressing and uncompressing, you can get back to something very, very much like what you started with. So that's what the output is. Let's define the batch size. And I'm actually gonna set a fairly large batch size. I don't usually use something as large as 128. I usually use around 32, which is a fair, a fair number, but I want this to train quickly. We're, we're running this on a machine with no GPU. It's, it's really not a machine learning system. So I just want to keep this, keep this moving along. And then let's set it to use uh, maybe 10 epochs in training. So how many times does it go through the training data? And off it goes. It's training, training, training. And it looks like it's going to be a couple of seconds, maybe about three, four seconds for each epoch. And while that goes, I'm actually just going to start writing in my next cell just to use my time well. Because once that finishes running, what I'd like to do is see how well it works. To do that, I'm going to get a set of predictions. So the predictions are, I'm going to use the model to do something after it has finished fitting. My predictions will be model.predict. Do I have data that it could do predictions on? Yeah, I do. The data it could do predictions on is going to be the X test data. And that's going to return a set of predictions for me that I could then look at. Let's just see how this is doing. Oh, look, it's all done. So it took uh, however long that is. So I guess about 40 seconds. That's not bad at all. So let's run our predictions. And what have I got? Oops. It would be nice if I put an equal sign in there. Dave's Python fail strikes again. And the predictions, there you go. 
and, and I know you probably look at those predictions and say, what does that mean? Well, what it's done is it's produced a string of bits, which is exactly what we asked it to do. The question, though, is, are those bits anything like what the input looked like? Well, to answer that question, let's look at this a different way. Let me start by maybe plotting this out. So I'm going to import matplotlib.pyplot as plt using plt because that's just, you know, what everyone uses. And let's do plt.plot. The, um, the, now I could just plot the bits, but that doesn't make sense. What I want to look at is how are the bits different from what was put in? So to find that out, I'm going to use tf.losses.mae. So hopefully looking at that, you can say, all right, so you're calling from TensorFlow from the losses library, the mean absolute error function. And to use that, I then need to pass it two sets of data. I'm going to pass it x test as one set of data. That's what it should have been reconstructing. And I'm going to pass it predictions as the other set of data, and then ask it to show me the graph. And there we go. That's what it looks like. But is that good? I mean, how does that solve our problem? That's a totally fair question to ask. And the answer is that doesn't solve our problem directly. To solve our problem, we need something else. Right now, we're asking it to tell us what the loss looks like when I reconstruct TLS data. But as, as I tell people when I teach this class, loss, loss isn't really on any scale. The value of the loss isn't useful unless you have something to compare it to. So what can we compare it to? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to grab this code here. And let me just come back on down. And what I'm going to do is load in another set of data. And I think I want some of this other stuff here, too. Do I need that? No, maybe I don't. OK. So what I want to do is load in the HTTP data as well. So let me load that in. And once that's loaded in, what I need to do is to convert that stuff to be on the, um, the NumPy array again, because right now it's a list. So let me say my HTTP data is going to be a NumPy array of raw data as type uint8. And let's just see what that looks like. All right, so we've got a problem here. Uh, UN date is, ah, sorry, np.und. There we go. So I have 15,000 rows, 256 columns. That seems perfectly correct. What I want to do is do predictions on that and plot it against the data that I have using TLS. But there is a little issue here. My TLS data, if I look at, um, let me look at, predictions that shape is only 7,400 things. So I'm just going to have it do predictions on a smaller set of this. Let me do this. Let me do a plt.plot, get.losses.mae, and I'm going to ask it to do that against predictions. Predictions, I think that's right. And yeah, oh, actually, I want to plot. I want to plot the two things against each other. So let me use x test again. The thing it should have had. It really doesn't matter what order I put these in. I could put predictions first. It doesn't really matter because it's still going to be the absolute error. It doesn't matter much. But now my second plot is going to be tf dot losses dot mean absolute error. But what I'm going to compare will be. Let's use the HTTP data. I'll use the first 7,400 things. Why 7,400? Because that's how many things I have from TLS that are left over in my test set. So let's let's compare the losses of that against model.predict HTTP data set colon 7,400. So run predictions on those first 7,400 things. And then, okay, I'm missing a parenthesis. There we go. 
and then plt.show. All right. There we are. Now I have something to compare that loss to. And that's pretty interesting. If you noticed on the opening image, I had a uh, kind of objective there. And the objective, one of the objectives was to make this linearly separable. Now, linearly separable, that's sort of a thing from uh, from clustering, from unsupervised learning, where you're trying to figure out, you know, how can you divide this data evenly? And right now, I think that if we draw a horizontal line at 0 0.35, man, it sure does look like that is very nearly linearly separable. It looks like there might be two outliers, two false negatives, I suppose you'd say, where it's misclassifying HTTP as TLS. That's pretty darn good. Let me make some changes though. Let's tinker a little bit. I'm gonna come up to the top here and I'm gonna change max length. Let's, let's not use 32 characters. Let's use 16 characters, 16 bytes. I'm just gonna use kernel, restart and run all cells. And that'll take it a couple seconds because it's got to reload all the data again. And that's probably the longest piece of this. The training I don't really think will take very long because I'm actually using fewer features. And notice now that my choice to use the division in here turns out to pay off because I don't have to rewrite the network because I have some different number of features. It's pretty trivial to make this change. And what I'm looking to see is, can I make it even even more separable? Can I make it even more of a clear distinction between the two? Let's see how this does. I don't really care about the first graph. There we go. That, that one doesn't matter. It's the second one that matters. And woo. All right. So that's maybe that's a bit better, but I do see that around the 3000 mark, whatever sample that is, that one's starting to pop into HTTP territory. All right. Let, let's try this again. Let's take this down. I don't know. Let's try it at eight bytes. Let's see how eight bytes does. Let's do kernel, restart, and run all cells. Hello from Denmark. Nice to have you, Barrington. I have to say, Barrington, uh, and, and please, no offense here, but Barrington doesn't sound like a name I'd hear a lot in Denmark. Are you from Denmark originally, or have you moved there, or, or what's the story? I, I mean, I've had some friends from Denmark in the past. I haven't seen them in a long time, but no one with a name like Barrington. It just makes me kind of curious. All right, so this training again should be even faster. Oh yeah, it's just blazing through there. All right, and oh, I like that. Look at what's changed. Not only are the losses different, but notice, never does something in the HTTP world drop down to the TLS and nothing from the TLS side ever pops up to HTTP. So by just doing a little tinkering, we have successfully created an autoencoder that lets me say, is this TLS or not? Now, for those of you who have done uh, maybe some binary regression or logistic regression, you might be looking at this and saying, "Is this, how is this different from that? Oh, Fishkill, New York. Hey, I wonder if that's my buddy, Dan. Good to see you there from Fishkill. Um, how is this different from doing that logistic regression? Well, here's the big difference. Look back at how we did that model.fit. When you do a logistic regression and you do your model.fit, uh, it's somewhere down here, here it is, you need to pass it in samples that are both the one thing and the other. Is it this or not this? So I have to give it samples that are not this. I don't need to do that with an autoencoder. I can just give it samples of the thing I want to be able to identify. And it learns, it doesn't learn how to identify that, but it learns how to reconstruct that. And the beautiful thing about it, and it's being illustrated here when I pass in that HTTP data, it is entirely different when I now give it a different type of data. Does that hold true with other kinds of protocols? Now, I, I haven't tested this, so let's just see how this goes. I'm going to load in this port 53 data, and I'm not going to change the name. I hope that doesn't confuse you. I'm still going to call it HTTP data. There are only 49 instances of it, though. So when I do this, I'm going to have to modify this a little bit. I'm going to have to say, let's just use 49 things here and 49 things here. 
and I can get rid of these these markers here. Because now, while it says HTTP, now we're looking at DNS data. And let's just see how that does. And, and again, now there's a little overlap here. We might be benefit from having more or fewer bytes, but we would tune it again, right? We would tune it again. And I feel like that in tuning this one, I would probably tune it to use more bytes and see if we can again become linearly separable. This model can distinguish between a TLS and other stuff. That means that if I have TLS encrypted data appearing on some other port, well, this can tell you it's TLS. You don't need to go try to pull that into Wireshark and extract it or do anything else. You can tell that it's TLS. It will report it to you. But if it's not TLS, you'll know that too. Well, where do I go from here? Let me... Uh, Go back up to the top of this, because I said I would also talk about how to scale this. What we've done is created an autoencoder that finds one protocol. It can distinguish, is it this or not? What do I do with that? Well, I'll tell you how we use this model. What we've done is built in a class, a Python class, that implements an autoencoder function for this type of problem, an anomaly detector. And what you do is pass it in all of the data you want to do training on, all of the different protocols for it to learn, and it builds individual autoencoders for every one of them. Now, I can simply pass in content and it will report back to me, oh, that's DNS, or oh, that's NTP, or I have no idea what that is, because it can now tell if it is something but also if it's not something. And that's very important because usually when you do classification problems with supervised learning, you have to say it's one of the classes you define. It makes it hard to do anomaly detection. There are ways around it, they're troublesome, but this one works super well because this is really, is it this or not? This is anomaly detection. And the way we're measuring that is by measuring the loss. In our case here, I've chosen to measure the loss using the mean absolute error, but I'll tell you that when I usually do this, and in the class that we use, we use mean absolute error to do the training, but then we use the kolbeck leibler divergence loss to, to do the evaluation. And the reason we do that is the kolbeck leibler loss, and I'm not, I'm not going to derive or show you how that works at all. But what it really does is measures the distance between distributions. And I prefer to use that because right now we're outputting, let's say 128 bits and then measuring the absolute loss of all of them, turning it into a scalar. And that maybe not isn't the best way to measure the loss, but the kolbeck leibler loss looks at them as a distribution of bits. So I get a different measurement of how different it is and at least I find that in this problem, it's much more accurate when building the autoencoder. So when we started this live stream a few weeks back, we started out with the notion that there would be a way to take data from Zeek and push it into TensorFlow. And at this point, we've actually done that. Along the way, we've learned a little bit about how to get broker to communicate. We've learned how to extract data out of a TCP stream and have that forwarded over to us within Python. We then took that and decoded that data, turning it back into bits so that we could flexibly try to push that into a neural network, which we've now built today. In particular, in our neural network today, building an autoencoder that is phenomenally good for, for anomaly detection, anomaly detection that is usually relegated to the task of unsupervised learning. That is a whole other host of problems. We're not going to get into that now. Maybe in some future episode, we'll talk a little bit about that. I do hope you found some value in these last couple of episodes. And if, if you have enjoyed them, please do post a comment in there. Give us some feedback about it. Tell your friends about it. Of course, click on the subscribe button or on the follow button on LinkedIn. And just as a preview, in our last live stream, someone was asking, could you use a random forest to do some of this? And that's a very interesting question. I'm going to say, no, I cannot do this with a random forest. However, that doesn't mean that random forests aren't useful. So in our next live stream, what we're going to do is have a look at this statistical learning method, 
random forests and see what I can do with those. In particular, seeing if we can do some multi-class classification, maybe of some network protocols or maybe of files. Maybe that's a in more interesting one. Taking things away from networks, let's see if we can do file classification. So a thing I could run against files sitting on a file server and tell me what type they are. Where's the value in that? I mean, couldn't I look at the file extension? Well, you could, but that file extension doesn't mean that's actually what they are. It's a very trivial thing, but it's not uncommon for people to try to hide files by just changing their file extension. So maybe a tool that would tell us if there's a file type that doesn't match its extension. Maybe that's a way we'd use that. Anyway, that's what's going to be in our next live stream. I do hope you've enjoyed this. If you have any last minute questions, do feel free to ask. But otherwise, I appreciate you being here. I look forward to seeing you in the next, next live stream. If you are looking to learn more about how to do this, how to build these networks, how to think about these problems, how to take your cybersecurity problems and transform them into feature sets you can use for machine learning and other data science problems, then have a look at SEC 595. Now, the next run of that is uh, sort of in Orlando, air quotes on the Orlando, because, of course, we're running it remotely. But that one's already sold out. There is another one running in London that still has some seats. That one is, again, it's both done, being done sort of in person, but I won't be there. I'll actually be remote streaming into where they're running it. And people can attend that remotely as well. There's another one running, I believe it's in December, which will be happening in D.C. and currently is scheduled to actually happen in D.C., though you can also simulcast that event. So if you want to learn more about how to do this and solve your problems with machine learning, maybe sign up for that class. Those seats are selling fast, though, so, so don't wait too long. Otherwise, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this. I look forward to seeing you in our next live stream. Thank you.